reckless love? Yeah, it is pretty reckless if you think about it. The unique relationship that of all creation we have with God. I'd like to first begin by thinking of that recklessness by framing what is possibly the most asked question in the faith exploration process. Someone that really wants to consider what God is doing and consider the legitimacy of that, there is usually a question that comes up and it goes something like this. If God is all powerful, then why does God treat the world like God does? Recklessly, if you think about it. They're essentially saying, and I'm sure you've had conversation like this. Maybe it was a question that you have asked. Why doesn't God do something about the spot we're in? Why doesn't God do something about it? Doesn't God get it? Doesn't God understand grasp or have compassion for the human hurt and loss that is rampant in our world. Now that is the question. I'm going to take you to an area that I believe these three parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost child will give us a particular kind of an insight to that question. But first and briefly, we need to ask, what was lost? What was lost? Think about it. Uh, A sheep is lost. By the way, Anna, you did a great job reading that. Wow, that was spectacular. Sheep is lost. And uh, shepherd goes, brings it back. We're told he, he, he actually uh, put to risk his own well-being. So if you want to know us, uh, understanding about a hero is the shepherd here is really a hero. And then uh, this was also the parable that our kids this week studied in jam, which is why we're doing it this morning, because we want the adults to get the benefit of what the kids were able to be a part of. And then there's immediately Jesus goes to another parable, and I think these are all interconnected. That's why we have a little longer reading this morning. A lost coin, and a lady searches for it until she finds it. She puts it where it belongs. And they have a big party. I, I found my Krugerrand or whatever. A lost coin. And then there is this younger son who decides that living under his parents' roof with all that love and security and good food just isn't cutting it anymore. And so the kid comes up with a a brilliant idea. Dad, why don't you give me my inheritance now and I will get out of your hair? What are you saying? Now, I don't know about you, but if I tried something like that to my dad, he would have sent me off on a one-way ticket to take a time out. <laughs> time out. But in this story, the father agrees. A sheep is lost, you go after it. A coin is lost, and you find it. A child is lost, and the father, I'll just stay home. You have to understand it by looking at those three stories. Let me ask you, is a lost sheep more valuable than a son? Is a lost coin 
more valuable than a lost son? I don't think so, and, and you don't either. So we have to push the question a little bit more than why. When the boy is lost, you let him be lost. And when the sheep or a coin is lost, you go and find it. Now, I think that answer, the answer to that question is a much larger idea. And it's an idea where we all have been. Because there is a difference in all of God's creation between a sheep and a coin and a human being. And here's a simple difference, and that is an inanimate object, like a sheep or a coin, has no will towards its destiny. A sheep, you know, it's an animal. And by definition, we could say that an animal is something that is pawned by its environment. But a human being, how we are different is we have an ability to a degree to manipulate our environment. We can manipulate things we get ourselves into, things we engage in, things that we value, but I don't think other animals have that. We can manipulate things towards social ends. We can manipulate things towards personal ends, but an, an animal just, just, just can't do that. So when a boy is lost, the father realizes there are certain limitations he's able to do. And I'd like for you to kind of picture that dynamic as an image of the relation of God to you. Think of that. What do you do, or what do you suppose God will do to someone who says, I'll do what I want to do because I want to do it? That's usually how we live. God, leave me alone and quit picking on me. And what does God do? He says, I'll leave you alone. That is the human difference. Now, there's another difference between a sheep and a coin and a person. And, and, and I, I like this difference because it, 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 it's, it's, it's so, so remarkable. And it has to do with the way that God is glorified. You know, what's the purpose of worship? It's not here to be entertained, though we have remarkable entertainment that it throws us and moves us closer to God. But it's not about entertainment. It's about praising God, and it's about honoring God. And if you look around you, we're surrounded by the most remarkable way in which God is honored, and that is the creative world. Look, all around you. By its very being, we... Like at that video that Kostya played to, that remarkable music, and seeing the environment, it, it just honors God at every turn. Nature does, the garden does. And there's a process that goes on here. There's, you know, rain hits the ground, it enters the tree root system, and it goes into the leaves. We have a lot of leaves around here. And you find the trees, they're, they're doing something that that uh, they have to do, and that's the, the, the whole photosynthesis. And then there's the carbon dioxide cycle. The sun, will, it'll rise in the east. It'll set over here in the west, summer, fall, winter, and spring. The seasons glorify God. And even the human body glorifies God. 
The human body is a remarkable wellness machine. And when, when you think about all that, that, that makes the human body what it is to be, it glorifies God. The laws of physics. Science is not conflict with faith at all. It glorifies God. Nature reveals the beauty of creative design. But in God's creation, of all this, God says, well, there's a group of two-legged creatures who can stand in the midst of all of this, and they can say, I'll do what I want to do because I want to do it. Yeah. Now, why do we get to do that? Why? You know, a, a tree, that tree cannot say, I refuse to do the carbon dioxide cycle today. I refuse to do photosynthesis. I'm going to be rebellious as a tree. It can't. It can't. It doesn't have that freedom. A tree cannot refuse to do what it was created to do. And if we were like that, then the distinction would be blurred between a sheep and a coin and a person. Be blurred. So God has created us in God's image. And in doing so, God has taken a fantastic risk that God is voluntarily limited in direct proportion to how much freedom that God has given to us. God's limitation is our freedom. That is a risk that God has. Then we have to push a little further. Why? Why, Why do we get this special deal? Why are we favored so much? And the simple answer is voluntary allegiance is of greater value than compulsory allegiance. Last Wednesday, Mercedes and I celebrated 48 years of marriage. Isn't that cool? Yay. <laughs> what a thank you all. What a thank you for all that you did to just to make it a special event. We, we had a great time at Grill and Chill. I just, it was wonderful. Uh, but when I, when I think of voluntary allegiance as a greater value than compulsory allegiance, I have to remind myself that in 1975 when we were dating, and then 76 came about, and I knew that her school term was ending and she would be going back to Nicaragua and I would lose this gal I had to ask her to marry me. And I thought she would be overwhelmed. Oh, of course, yes, Lonnie. I would rather give up ocean living. For, well, forget that. <laughs> and she didn't say yes. She didn't say no. She said, well, I got to think about that. <laughs> she had to think about it. But she was free to decide, and the direction of her life and the life of others would be determined by uh, how you negotiate what comes your way and the decisions you make. So uh, it's quite a, quite a story, isn't it? But in all of this, we get a glimpse that God is carrying on in the human project in your life, in my life, a value system. It is a value system that cannot be carried on with inanimate objects and animals. Can't. The people who are made in the image of God can reciprocate their love 
voluntarily. And so, putting this to the conclusion, the prodigal son is ultimately a story not about a, a runaway kid, but it is a story about the boundless, gracious love, reckless love of God. It teaches us that no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. No one. That whether we identify with the younger son, and you know, in the story we could go a lot of different directions. There was another son who loved hanging around the house and was a little, had a hardened heart and there was a dynamic there. But the message is the same, that God's love is ready to receive us, to forgive us, and to restore us. And all we need to do is say, I want that kind of love, God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your unfailing love and grace. Help us to see ourselves in these parables and to respond with humility. May we never take your love for granted. And may we always rejoice when others experience your grace. Bring us closer to you and let us live in the joy of your presence, both now and forever, in Jesus' name.